All rise. Court is now in session with the Honorable Jerry J. Bowles presiding. You can be seated. There's a number of things that make my domestic violence court or docket unique. One of the differences in our jurisdiction here is that we also do compliance reviews for our domestic violence protection cases. So when a domestic violence order is entered at the due process hearing, that's not the end of the case for us. We continue those respondents to come back until we're satisfied that they have some level of compliance and accountability for the orders that we're entering. Looks like we've got a long history of getting you through this program. Yes, it has. We are now two years post uh, the original order, correct? Right. So I've issued three warrants for your arrest, I've lodged three contempt charges, and you've been enrolled three different times in a batter's intervention program. Does that sound about right? Sounds about right, sir. Okay. What's going to be different this time that you're going to get the treatment you need? In the criminal courts, um, many communities use probation officers to monitor compliance on criminal cases. You don't have that in a civil case. And so we started doing re compliance review hearings in my community because we needed to guarantee that the batterers were in fact attending the treatment to know if the treatment was effective or not. What's going to be different? Yeah. What's Why going? should the court believe that you're going to finish this program? Because uh, I've been following through my probation and parole and, I'm, and I am following through my treatment. i got four classes left and I have a good feeling that I will get it done and I am going to get it done. Okay. Do you have any question about this court's tenacity about you getting this done? I know, sir. I totally understand what you just said to me. Okay. You won't wear me out. You understand? I appreciate that. I'll, I'll be here, right? I'll see you again if I mess up. Okay. It's, it's very um, deliberate as to how I have those cases called. I want the people who are there for their first reviews to understand that if they don't complete the treatment, that there will be consequences. Defendants and respondents are repeatedly um, experiencing no or little consequences sometimes through the court system. I want them to know up front if they're not getting the treatment that's ordered that there's going to be consequences for that because I want to give them the incentive to, to comply and to get that treatment and really make changes um, for themselves and for their families. So. I have my sheriff call actually the cases that are non-compliant first so that they understand that there are going to be consequences. All right, and you were previously non-compliant. Court lodged a contempt charge against you, issued an arrest warrant. You were picked up and brought back before the court on September the 9th. Um, you hear me talk to the guy who's been in here for two years trying to get through this program? Yes, sir. Okay. Court doesn't ever let go of this, right? It's that important that you finish the treatment. The first group that comes in are the ones that are in custody because they've been sentenced on contempt for willful violation of the orders of the court. They're then seeing the ones who aren't present, who didn't show up for the compliance reviews, who warrants are being issued because they've signed orders to appear and then third are the ones that come up that are in compliance. All of our respondents in order to attend domestic violence batter's intervention treatment have to register with our court monitoring center. So the respondent has 10 days to enroll with one of those, those providers. Then the respondent has to come back to court in approximately six weeks to, to show the court that they are enrolled in attending that domestic violence per, uh, perpetrator treatment program. There is a form that the case specialists send to the court monitoring center, and the court monitoring center reports back if that individual is enrolled in attending. And so the case specialist has the information whether the respondent is attending the treatment program or whether they're non-compliant with that court order. So the morning when they have to come back to court, the case specialist knows who should be compliant and who probably will need to be re-referred to treatment. Um, and if the respondent doesn't show up, as you saw today, 
the judge will issue an arrest warrant if the respondent is not compliant and isn't present for the court hearing, then the judge likely will issue a bench warrant on for that respondent's arrest. Let the record reflect the respondent failed to appear for show cause compliance hearing. Respondent was present in court on September 25th. The case was continued today for additional review. According to the Court Monitoring Center, the respondent was initially attending the Batters Intervention Program with the West End Counseling Program. There is an affidavit filed with the court by court monitoring indicating that the respondent failed to complete the program on 7-21-14. Court's going to lodge a contempt charge to Esponte. Issue a bond of 1,000 full cash for failure to comply with the domestic violence order. I have a personal philosophy that if litigants feel like that they've been respected and they feel like they've been heard, that it's not your decision as much as the feeling that they've had the opportunity to be heard and that they've been listened to and that they've been respected. And my hope is that once I make a decision that the parties are going to understand the seriousness of my orders, the accountability of my orders, and the fairness of my orders. Not everybody's going to agree with my decision, but I believe that you have a better chance of your orders being followed if somebody believes that you at least listened to them and explained your thought process of why you made the decision you made. We're here today for a show cause hearing regarding Mr. Miller's compliance with the court's order to enroll in a batter's treatment program. Mr. Miller, at the previous court hearing, this court found that you had been physically abusive to Ms. Miller and issued a no contact order as a part of that order, you were ordered to complete the batter's intervention. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. There is a statement that you've provided from Mr. Pangbird, Pangburn, who you've chosen to attend his BIP program. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. All right. Mr. Pangburn has indicated to the court that you've attended two sessions so far. He explained to you how many sessions you're required to attend. All right, it's a 28 session program by state law. All batter intervention providers who are court approved have to provide a minimum of 28 weeks. Um, so you are two weeks into your 28 week commitment to comply with the batter's treatment order. You understand that? Yes, sir. All right. The reg regs that the therapists work under is that you are provided with up to three absences that you can make up. Your fourth absence, you're out of the program. Mr. Pangburn has indicated in his report to the court that you had an injury to your ankle and missed a class already, is that correct? Yes, I just, I just missed a class this Wednesday. All right, so you have two more classes before you would be turned in non-compliant, you understand that? Yes, sir. So you want to save those for an emergency because whether you tell them your grandmother died or whether you're watching a football game, they're not investigators, they're therapists. They're not gonna go out and check up on why you're not there. They just have a rule that they're required by the court that if you miss more than three sessions, you're terminated and you come back to the court for non-compliance. So it's going to be important that this is a priority because it is part of the court's order. You understand that your failure to complete the batter's intervention program would result in this court holding a contempt hearing for violation of the underlying domestic violence order. Yes, sir. And this court has the power to sentence you up to six months in jail for violating the orders of the court. Yes, sir. All right. So in addition to you complying with all of the protection parts of the order as it relates to Ms. Miller, you're required to complete the batter's intervention program. All right. Judge Bowles is extremely respectful to all the parties who come before his court. I mean, he, he may not appreciate their behavior, but he never treats anyone disrespectfully. He gives them a great deal of information about 
the orders that he is going to enter, that he has entered. I mean, no one should be able to walk out of that courtroom without knowing specifically what the orders are and what the expectations are for him. One of the benefits that I've seen when they come back for the compliance review is really the issues are about them at that stage, and that's a very different type of proceeding. Um, you see many of those respondents who finally have accepted that they do have issues and almost a relief that now they can address those issues. They don't need to hide those issues anymore, but they can start to work on what they can do to change their behaviors. Mr. Stoner, I show that you are compliant. You have registered with the Court Monitoring Center and you are attending your batter's intervention program with New Beginnings as well. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. How many sessions have you attended with New Beginnings? And how are those? Those are fine. It's a whole lot different. I'm able to open up and express myself and talk. So great. I think it's going to work out. Great, great. And you'll find through the course of the 28 weeks that'll only improve. Okay. okay? Um, it's men who go through the program tell me that it builds. <coughs> okay? And, and that's the advantage of being in the group is, as other men share similar experiences, right. you find out that you're not the only one that's had issues, right? right? And that's somewhat empowering to know that other people have had some of the issues that you've had, and they're open-ended groups, so people are at the end of the group that you're with, people are coming into the group. You'll find when you're at the end of your treatment, you'll be able to share as you open up with people who are just coming in who may still be in denial on some of the tactics or issues that they've used in their relationships. Working in a compliance review docket to an already crowded docket was a challenge and getting buy-in by the other courts was, was the real challenge. Um, and what I was able to convince the courts and the chief judge at the time was able to convince the judges was Let's try it for six months and see if, in fact, compliance reviews result in better accountability and, and less recidivism, then ultimately our dockets will be reduced. And so we kind of looked at the drug court models in having people come back as opposed to just granting probation or sending them to jail and they serve out and they're back on the streets. There's something about that personal relationship that starts to develop by doing the reviews. Um, and so each of us have set aside a half an hour of our domestic violence docket to do the compliance reviews. And then we go into our regular new domestic violence cases and then our motions. Um, and what we found is it doesn't take that much time with the assistance of our case specialists who already get all that information for the courts as to the level of compliance from the Court Monitoring Center and through the um, providers. For the last um, 10 years, our entire family court term, all 10 divisions do compliance reviews weekly for their domestic violence docket. I mean, there was no additional cost to us. Um, we just committed to spend a little extra time on the dockets with the belief that we were providing a better service to the community if we were able to um, get the respondents the treatment they needed to make the changes and as a result reduce the safety risks. And in fact, we've seen a reduction in petitions and the level of violence as a result of the enforcement of, of the orders. I was also successful in getting the Corrections Department to agree to develop a court monitoring department within the Corrections Department where once we had the providers linked with the Corrections Department and we had done at least initial reviews to guarantee that they were linked with their treatment provider and with the court monitoring center, we could remand them off the court's docket with the understanding that they would be redocketed by the Corrections Department and brought back before us if they stopped attending the treatment before they completed. The case specialist will do a criminal record background check on both parties. They'll also do a family court record search. So if either of them has had protective orders filed against them, if they have a paternity case, 
if they have if there's been a child abuse or neglect case then the case specialist gathers all of that information copies it and puts it in the the folder the case folder that the judge receives when he's hearing the case um, my feeling about it was the more information that I could provide to the court about those individuals before him, the better decision he could make.